Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I am your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with a coaching legend, honestly, a guy that has coached probably more big names on tour than anybody. Uh, and that comes with its uh, gravitas, but it also comes with its challenges. But well-known, well-respected, a great player in his own right that a lot of people may not know. Uh, we got Michael Joyce on the show. Mike, thanks for coming on. Uh, pleasure, Kamal. Looking forward to it. So, Mike, when I first came on tour, I knew you as Maria Sharapova's coach. Right. Um, I didn't know Mike as the junior Wimbledon champion. I didn't know the, you know, fourth round of Wimby in 95. You know, tell me about your own playing career. Because I think sometimes when you become a coach of like a big name player, how you got there gets lost. So yes. tell me about how yeah. you got started in tennis, where you grew up, how you got to a junior slam. Because that's no easy feat. Yes. Well, first of all, I should hire as my agent because I actually lost in the finals. So when uh-huh. <laughs> I, but I did, I lost to Thomas Anquist, but it was, a, uh, it was a good result. Uh, no doubt. Uh, it's funny. I grew up in LA. Um, and, uh, I, I always did pretty well in my, in the juniors, my dad played tennis. Uh, he, he loved tennis. And so he got me into it pretty early. Uh, he was, I was lucky enough. He, he made, he was a director of photography, made movies. So he, uh, he retired more or less when I was about 14, 15. So it gave him a lot of time to spend with me, um, take me to tournaments and spend extra time on the court. And, but back then, uh, we're probably similar ages, uh, back then it wasn't at 13, 14. I don't think you're thinking so much of being like a pro. It's kind of like, you know, you're playing because you love tennis and you're getting ready for the next junior tournament. And you're, you know, and then all of a sudden when I was about 16, 17, I, I think I started, and obviously my mom was always, especially my mom was like, Oh, you need to go to college. And I was looking to get a scholarship to college. And I followed UCLA quite a bit because I, I live near UCLA. So that was kind of my plan was to play, do well in the juniors, go to college. And then when I was 16, 17, it's when I started thinking this is something that I'd, I'd like to do and be a pro. Uh, where I find nowadays a little different with all the internet and social media, you, you have kids and, and parents at a super young age that expect them to be the next uh, 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 Serena or something, you know, from a really young age. So I think the mentality's changed a little bit since mm-hmm. when we were younger. Um, but then I, I did really well in 1991 was my last year in the juniors, the year I lost in the finals of junior Wimbledon. I won Kalamazoo and I was actually all set to go to UCLA that, that, that fall. And then after winning Kalamazoo and I won around at the open, I decided to turn pro um, in 91, towards the end of 91. And then that turned into a, a pretty much about a 10, 12 year playing career. Um, but the first year or two was tough. I had some injuries and coming out of the juniors, you, you go from winning you know, 95% of your matches to, to losing <laughs> 75% of the time and, and getting through that for a couple of years. And then I finally got to a point where I, uh, reached top hundred and, and had some good results in the pros. And, and, and then in 90, probably in 97, I had to have surgery on my left wrist, which, um, kept me out for about a year and a half. And I never quite was the same after that. I got back to close to top hundred, but that's, uh, I had about three, four years where I was pushing to get back to where I was playing guys like James Blake and Robbie Ginepri and Marty Fish and Andy Roddick playing those guys week in and week out in challengers. Um, it was a kind of a tough, um, you know, it, it was a tough to, for me to get back. And then that's when I transferred over to, to coaching pretty much so let me ask you because you know there's always like sometimes there's like a big win uh or even an agent signs you gives you some seed money yeah your was it the one round at the open that made you believe the time it's actually yeah it's a great question it's a funny story too uh, because there was a guy named pat crow uh who is kind of a legendary uh southern cow player Uh, most people our age, especially from Southern Cal, would know him. Peter Smith, uh, you, the great coach Peter Smith, was a coach at Long Beach. I think it was Long Beach State. And he had actually a really good team. Uh, he had guys like Pat Crow and Mitch Bridge. And these guys, 
um, played a lot of open tournaments in Southern Cal and, and, you know, they were ranked maybe two, 300 or whatever. Uh, but I, when I was 16, 17, I started playing a lot of open tournaments besides the juniors. And, and it was funny because I had played Pac Pro probably two or three times in open tournaments where I had beat him. I probably lost to him once or twice, but I beat him a couple of times. And so the year I won Kalamazoo, I was all planned to go to college uh, in the fall. And, and the thing is, back then, it's different than now. I mean, you know, back then, there wasn't a lot of players that went to college for four years and actually could make it on the tour. It was kind of like, you know, if you did go to college, it was usually for a year or two. And it was almost like the mentality, if you end up going to college for four years, you're almost too far behind. Uh, but then again, this was a time when people were retiring at 30 years old. And so you know, it's, things have changed, obviously, a ton since then, but I had my mindset on college, and then when I won Kalamazoo, I went to the Open. Uh, I, I think I got there for qualifying to practice, and because that was the plan. I was going to maybe play qualifying, then I was going to play juniors, and I ended up, the draw came out, I played one qualifier, I mean, I played a qualifier, and there was one qualifier, like, I felt like I could beat, like, or somebody, and it was that Pat Crow, and I ended up playing him first round, and it was, it's so funny because if you know him, he's a super nice guy, but he used to kind of drink beer. He looked more like a bouncer at a club than a tennis player. <laughs> and he, 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 I remember watching last round of qualities. He beat Sandin Stolly, who was the top seed in qualities and he beat him. And then I played Pat and it was really funny because I was down a set and I think down set points in the second set. And I came back, I won in four sets. And then I played this guy, Wally Masur, who, who was, uh, I think he made semifinals, but I lost to him in five sets. So I played a good match there. But I think the biggest thing for me that I decided to turn pro was I was able to sign partly probably from my junior results, but also winning the round. And I was able to sign pretty good contracts. Uh, not great, but maybe like a hundred grand a year or whatever, but that was going to be used for my pro career. And I think my parents and I were worried that if I had gone to college for a year or two, I could lose that opportunity. Uh, my parents were pretty well off. They weren't super wealthy, but they had enough money to get good coaching for me and traveling. And they wanted me to travel with a coach. So it kind of made sense at the time for my first two, three years on the pro tour. Like I needed to kind of jump on that uh, at the time. And, um, you know, in hindsight, I always promised my mom I'd go back to college, but I never did. <laughs> so um, I, I started to play on the tour and then, you 10 12 years go by and and then i was like oh yeah remember i told you i was gonna go back to college i don't think it's gonna happen now <laughs> but, um you know but it was a little bit of a different time back then but definitely winning kalamazoo probably wimbledon and then obviously winning the round at the open uh back then i think for second round prize money was eight grand which i thought was a lot at the time uh, i remember first round was five grand because i remember being pumped on one Kalamazoo, I was gonna get five grand. And so I got eight grand and then, um, yeah, I had the decent contract. So that's kind of what led into me going on tour. Yeah, I always say in tennis, industry is a huge indicator on your chances of making. They really don't miss. Absolutely. Miss. You know, Absolutely. like Nike, Wilson, you know, they really don't miss, right? If they, right. If they give you a check, you got a shot to at least be in top 150 making absolutely on well as, as you know i mean this is the biggest thing i tell I, I, especially the younger players or the transitional type players is if you're and you know better than anybody being a coach as well i mean at those ages you're still developing so yeah at 17 18 19 i mean even now the the younger boys 22 23 they're you're still developing as a player so if you're on the road playing 25 30 weeks out of the year uh, let's say, and, and, and you're losing early, which is going to happen a lot. I mean, you need a coach that's going to help you work on the road and keep improving. Right. And I think that's something that even back then, the fact that I was able to get that money to pay for a coach and to have somebody travel with me full time. Um, you know, now, obviously, you see the top players with full teams and stuff. But I think to send a kid out there at 18, 19, and they're gone 25, 30 weeks out of the year, and they're traveling by themselves, um, it's tough to, to ha do the work that you need to do to, to keep improving unless you're unbelievably self-disciplined and you have access to, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, and so having the luxury of having somebody with you um, is huge, especially at that age, because you, you can improve so much on the road, not, not just at home. So you talk about improving on the road and having a team. 
um, you know, when I first came on tour as a coach, I worked with Taylor Towns and me and Zena Garrison worked together on it. And then I jumped right into, you know, working with Sloan Stevens. Right. And that's sort of not like a, a, a very common thing. You know, normally you coach somebody, they train 15, 25, yeah. right? Uh, then maybe you get somebody that's top 150, maybe get somebody that's top 100, whatever like that. Um, but you had a very similar thing where you went from playing to coaching the face of women's tennis. Right. Yes. How did that happen? And were well, you ready was, for it? Looking back on it, were you ready? Yeah. You know, I, it was interesting because actually it was kind of in a way my second job. Uh, my first girl that I coached right off the tour was Alexander Stevenson, who obviously we know uh, pretty well. Um, and I actually chose coaching her over Maria. So that showed you kind of how much I knew, uh, <laughs> but it was kind of, I kind of stumbled across it a little bit. Um, when I was maybe 29, 30 years old, my mother um, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and, and uh, she was able to live for like four or five years with it. But it was right at the time where I was kind of, where we, a lot of pros, we all go through. It, I was about 28, 29 and I was kind of, I was still playing. I was still on tour, but I was spending majority of my time at home I didn't have any money really um not much money so I was doing a lot of uh, coach uh, coaching and hitting because I was still in good shape and I still played well at home in LA and so there was a period of time for a few months where I was actually hitting with Alexandra for two hours a day and I was hitting with Maria for two hours a day and Maria was like 16 Alexandra was like 19 and it was kind of funny because I used to always think like, why don't they play together? But they didn't, <laughs> did, did, they never wanted to play together. I mean, we, we know women, right? right. So right. It, it was more Alexander didn't really want to play with Maria uh, more than the other way at the time. But it was like, you know, so I'm sitting here going, okay, I'll take my 400 bucks and just keep hitting with them. <laughs> and so right, right. I developed a good relationship with both of them, even though I wasn't really like their primary coach. I mean, Alexander was working with Pete Fisher and then Maria was usually when I was hitting with her, she was in LA taking lessons with Landstore. Uh, but obviously I got to know them both pretty well. And so it was actually kind of funny because I went to Sweden and I kind of was done with playing more or less. And I was maybe still ranked about 150 or something, but I was starting to get into like the coaching mentality more. And then I, I went over to Sweden. I played this team tennis with Michael Russell uh, for like three months and uh, or three weeks, three weeks. And I got these emails while I was there from Alexander's mom and from Maria's from Max and stuff, all basically both asked me to go down to Australia. Uh, and so I had a choice to go with Maria or Alexandra. I chose Alexandra and because I figured at the time that she was better. I actually thought she was better because I was playing with both of them. And I figured I wasn't going to do it very long. And I figured like with bonuses and stuff like, you know, she could do, go down there and do some damage where I felt like Maria wasn't quite ready. And, and then I, so I worked with Alexandra for about four or five months, but she had a lot of bad like shoulder issues and stuff. And then, and then she ended up having shoulder surgery. And then I moved over to work with Maria and I kind of snuck in a little bit because at the time she was working with uh, Maria Seo Haddad uh, from Boletari. She had Boletari was in the picture. You had Robert in the picture. Her dad was coaching. So there was almost like too many people trying to take credit for being her coach. And I kind of was, I had known her for a long time. We had hit together for a lot. So when I started to travel with her, I was her coach, but I, I was almost like a big brother in a way, you know, I could hit with her all the time. I could spend hours with her on court. I, I wasn't like giving her a ton of info. I, I could see the, the patterns that the girls did. It, it felt pretty easy to see how her game could match up against different players. And, and I think she enjoyed that strategy you know, uh, concept of the stuff I could bring. And then little by little, and I, I learned a ton about coaching during those years of being with her. And so that was kind of an education for both of us. And, but I helped her in a way, I mean, obviously she had the basis of her game at that point when she was 17, um, 16, 17, but I was able to help her take more balls out of the air, move forward, you know, just typical stuff that I felt like her game things from my game and from the men's game could transfer a little bit to her. And, and that made a big difference. And, and then that's how, that's kind of how I got into coaching Maria, which then put me on the women's coach category. Right. That, 
<laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned the women's coach because I've only coached women. And right. So when I look at your roster, you only coach women. It's kind of like once you coach a woman, it's like you're, you're the women's coach. Well, that's what yeah. that's what happened to me. Exactly. Because because at the time, too, when I was sitting with Alexander and Maria, I was helping out like Kevin Kim. There was a guy named Robert Yim. I was helping out some of these guys that I was actually kind of playing against but I was also helping them transition to be a pro so I had a lot going but then obviously Maria is the one that kind of like you said became so famous took off so then I was known as Maria's coach and then my playing days my every men's coaching that all was kind of thrown out the window I was <laughs> Maria's coach. right so, so yeah. let me ask you this because you know you think about like big name personality you talk about how like the, by the time you get with the player they can hit the ball they it's sort of know who they are as a player, right? And you can kind of reach, right. speed, create some new habits. They kind of have their practice routine. And you mentioned that you said you didn't say much. Right. I've been on the court several times and had a player say, you're talking too much. Just, <laughs> right. Let's pick up the ball. How right. often did you get that? Well, it, it was interesting with Maria because it was also interesting because I still at 29 years old was playing really well. So it was funny because I, I was actually using those hits and practices to kind of I was playing a lot of money tournaments and, and I actually was winning a like, oh, hi, like I was still kind of ha so so I could play Maria and beat her like one and one. Right. And, you know, and so like I would do things or see things that I think, you know, she could do a little better or that there was something that was kind of she was doing that I could could see like I could read her shots or whatever and then the fact that I could beat her like that um made her almost listen more in a way I felt like because all of a sudden her, I'd do something and she'd be like oh how'd you do that or how you know and so it was kind of like that's it was more like I was kind of teaching and helping her uh it, through me at the time which obviously I couldn't do now but at the time it was almost like she was gaining experience because everything she was going through I had been through as a player which I think gave her also a lot of confidence in in what you, I was telling her and then you know her dad obviously was spent so much time with her I mean she'd take lessons from Robert or even when she was at Ball Terry her dad would you know speed her extra balls or work on her serve so there was always that he was more of like a technical guy in a way and, and, and in some cases I felt like he was too technical so you know Marie and I would try to find ways to kind of laugh about or kind of blow that out I mean we'd go for two months and not see him at all training and then he'd show up at a tournament I mean Yuri was great don't get me wrong I mean there would be no Maria if it wasn't for Yuri but you know we wouldn't see him for two months and all of a sudden he'd show up at a tournament and he'd start like looking at her technique or something and I'd be like okay we, we're gonna and then Maria so it was I was doing a lot of damage not I don't want to say damage but I was doing a lot of also control between you know a father a daughter obviously she was starting to become really famous so I was doing a lot of like the damage control of making things as as smooth as possible for Maria always being able to keep improving keep working and, and so in a way I think it's a lot of it's luck and, and also being in the right place at the right time and having having it was nice I think that when she was younger she was able to see me play on the tour I hit with her the first time when she was like nine or ten so she, mm -hmm. I, they were like familiar with me and and, it, and I came in full time with her at a time where her life changed. I mean, you know, she went from, I mean, us hitting over at South Bay Tennis Center with pretty much nobody really even knowing who she was to within a year, she's like you said, face of tennis. And, and she struggled right after winning Wimbledon. She struggled for a few months. People don't realize that that summer she lost first round. She, she really struggled that whole summer. And then we kind of got back on track in the fall and she ended up winning the championships in LA. And then she got used to kind of, that that life but but i i think the best she was playing was 19 20 years old was when she won australian open and and yeah, i think that's when like her game really everything came together you know and then obviously she had the shoulder injuries and stuff but it was it was it was a fun seven years there's no doubt but it it, it it was nice at that time period i think even like with training if she took a run we didn't have a huge team around us you know nowadays the players have huge teams but back then we had first two years her dad used to go to the tournaments and then we had this guy Juan who was like a physio and she had a trainer but I would do he didn't travel with us so I used to do the the training with her too which I was young enough I could take a run with her do stuff so I did almost everything with her which I think helped push her as well 
Um, but again, at 30 years old, it's a little easier <laughs> than we, now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after a couple of years, her dad started to not travel as much. And then the last three, four years, it was pretty much just her, me and the physio. That was it. And nowadays, the I was actually kind of surprised about four or five years after we stopped working, as her team started to grow, I thought it was kind of interesting because that's not really, she never really wanted like a ton of people around her. So I think some of the, you know, outside voices started to, I mean, you know how it is uh, when she was older, all of a sudden she had like eight people around her, which was kind of funny for me because that was never really how she was mm -hmm. growing up. She wanted to keep it small. So, you know, you talk about that, right? When I look at the list of players, you know, Joe Conta, Jeannie, I can give you 10 Jeannie stories, five yeah, Jesse stories, two Joe Contas, so where you end up being in the car with them, on transport, sharing a table, on a rain delay, whatever, in the gym at the same, or even like coaching against them, right? right. Um, Vika, same thing, but not one Maria story. I okay. feel like even compared to Serena, right, right. Venus, Maria had this sort of mystique about her and separation right. right, from the other players on tour and anybody else on tour. Um, was that intentional or was that yeah. just all in everybody else's own head? Well, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a story. I, I've only told a few people, um, and it, it, cause it's a great question. I mean, a lot of people just assume that, that she was the way she was just because it, it was her, let's say, um, which it turned out to be her because, but I think it was very intentional. And I don't think it was something like she just woke up one day and was like, OK, I'm just going to kind of separate myself from from all the other people. Uh, but I think it was, you know, as you know, coaching a lot of different people, everybody's different. Everybody's wired different. And and Maria was the type who is very competitive. She's super competitive in, in pretty much anything she does. Uh, tennis, when it comes to other sports and stuff, tennis, she's was good at, you know, she was good at tennis, obviously. She wasn't great at other things like basketball, little things that we would play or do that she wasn't necessarily that great at. Um, so tennis was like her thing, obviously. One thing that was funny was when she liked somebody too much, I could see it straight out. Like she would hold back like a ton. And, and like there was, a, she was actually good friends with Maria Karolanko when we first started, when she was 17, 18, she was really good friends with Karolanko. And they actually won a couple of doubles tournaments together. And, and Karolinko was probably one of the only girls that I felt like she was pretty close with, you know, and because she also girls didn't really approach her that much, too, because, you know, they kind of assume that she's a bitch or bitchy or whatever. So it's not like people are jumping to be friends with her, too. Mm -hmm. So she kind of just went about her business and stuff. But the funny thing with Karolinko, I actually had to stop after about two or three practices and I. I was totally like shocked myself. Like I had to like stop them practicing together because she was the only girl like Karolinko would come to the net and Maria would start like pushing the ball, didn't want to hit hard. And every other girl she'd practice with, she's taking the first ball and like trying to like, you know, <laughs> almost looks like she's hitting them, you know. <laughs> if Serena came to the net and they're warming up, Maria's, they're rifling balls at each other. But then with Karolinko, she's like going through the motion, you know, she's trying, but, and so, I would say to Maria, and then every time she'd practice her, Karolinko would kick her butt, like every time. But Maria would like barely play. And I'd be like, and so I talked, you know, and her dad would be like, oh, this is, this is a waste of time. But I think it was because they were like friends, like really close friends. So I think also Maria realized that if she liked somebody too much or if she was too close to them in a way, uh, it was hard for her to, to bring that intensity. And I do know that she did well with girls that in a way she didn't like that much. And then a lot of times she wouldn't like them for like no reason at all. <laughs> you know, like it was actually pretty funny. Her and, and Anna Ivanovich like never really like, they kind of like didn't even like each other. And then one day, and, and Anna was always, I didn't know her that well, but she was always friendly to me and she seemed like a nice enough girl. And then one day I said to Marie, I'm like, you know, what, what do you have against this Ivanovic? And she's like, ah, she's a bitch or something. I said, well, what did she do? And she's like, but well, no, nothing. I just know she is or whatever. And I'm like, you know, and, and, and so, and you know, and she'd go out to play Anna and she'd be like acting like, you know, she's playing like this enemy, but, but Maria would use that to like fire herself up and stuff. Right. And so I think it was, like you said, I think it was a, 
uh, and, and also she had friends, you know, off court friends. And I think it's a little different for the women too. She didn't like to hang out in the locker rooms and take showers there. And, you know, it's it, so, I mean, you probably dealt with it with Sloan. I mean, she liked to get, get away from the courts and, you know, play and leave. And so it just became kind of like normal. And, you know, and, and, you know, I get questioned a lot of times people will be like, Oh, Maria, you know, was bitchy or this or that. And, you know, she's actually really, has a great sense of humor uh, fun you know she was always really nice when if there's not a lot of people around some kid came up to get an autograph she was always great you know but it just I think also she was so recognizable I mean there was a period of time there where even when she was doing rehab on her shoulder she had those commercials with the dogs and can't you know so everybody knew her and so I think when you're constantly you know people coming up to you or recognizing you or want something from you it, it does kind of harden the shell around you and so I think it was a combination of all those things that kind of made her the way she was so you talk about I remember when um when Sloan you know number one you talk about getting better travel right on the road and I feel like when you're managing a personality right or coaching a personality like that who has a brand off the court even Vika right right they've got obligations off the court and it is it does become challenging to improve between events, right? Because yeah. everybody's planning the other business between events, sure. right? Right. And you got to right. respect that because that's, that's like money. Pays the bills, right? You know, you know what I mean. So, how much of a challenge with it? And the reason why I say is when when Sloan won the U.S. Open in 2017, uh, a commentator who's now a friend of mine said, "Well, Kamau really didn't coach her to the U.S. Open title. He just managed the process, <laughs> right?" right? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, well, I think that year the Yankees like won the pennant. I was like, yeah, well, Joe Torre is a manager as well. Exactly. You know what I mean, it was like that. That's how I just said, yeah. I, that's how I processed it, right? Yeah. Um, how how did you find that from a coaching, but also trying to improve, right. and also working with the entire team, whether it be Mac, whoever else, to sort of manage the tennis right. and the business. Well, I got to give Max a lot of credit. I mean, I think that's, um, I mean, again, especially with Maria, it was kind of a learning process, you know, for, for all of us. I mean, especially in, in those days. Um, one thing I, that was very clear is, especially I think the girls maybe go through it, when Maria would have to do an appearance or something, it would take a lot more out of her than, than a normal day of practice. You know, I mean, even at the U S open or something, and now, now U S open, let's say you get there a week before that's typically when all the sponsors, a lot of people pay on the players, that's when they want to see you, or you got to make an appearance. And then the girls have to do makeup and they do all this and that. And so what we figured out pretty quick was that that stuff really tired her out a lot more than just the normal practice day or training you know mentally and having people put makeup on and do your hair and all this and that and so I remember the first couple of times we went to some of the slams that was always something that it was not always that easy to get her practice in to get her training to get her if um you know let's say you you're training and then you want to do a massage or you want to do something uh recovery is that going to run into your time of getting the makeup and everything for the red carpet event or something? So, yeah. you know, we, yeah, yeah it, it's, it, people don't realize. And, and then they always tend to run around the big tournaments because that's where even keep a skin or USO that that's when, you know, obviously all the sponsors, everything are there. So Max was very clear, like after the first year or two, we, she would try to do everything the first couple of days and then come, thursday friday before the tournament we cut everything out yeah. and you know and then it's just 100 percent just tennis and you know some of her sponsors and stuff maybe didn't like it but it was we we just drew the line and then throughout the year what we would do is she tried to get as much done within a week or two as she could and just like do commercials whatever she needed to do she tried to do it within a week or two uh whether it's maybe twice a year but we didn't do a lot of like that stuff and tennis i mean there was one time in particular she was in la i remember japan she had to do like a shampoo commercial or something 
I remember they were paying her like a million bucks to do some shampoo commercial. And then she had to do the commercial so many times. The next day we couldn't even practice her serve. She told me she couldn't lift her arms because she had to like fake wash her hair like 50 times. <laughs> and then the next year, Max was trying to get her to do it again. And she's like, no, it's not even worth it. I don't want to like, I can't li couldn't lift my arm for three days. Right. So, you know, I think it's just, I think that's where the agent kind of earns their money because obviously they're trying to, and it's similar with this Radha Kanu. I mean, it's a tough situation because she wins us open all of a sudden all this money's coming in and you kind of have to strike while the iron's hot. So, you know, but then obviously maybe in some ways her tennis and stuff is suffering a little bit, but who's to say what's right or wrong. Um, because ultimately as a coach, as a player, you want them to do as good as they can in tennis um, because the, be the better they do, the more money so forth can come in. But it, it, it's always a tricky, and again, it, a lot of it, I think, depends on the person. And I think a lot of the player uh, needs to stand up a little bit too and say, listen, I, I want to earn this money. I mean, one thing about Maria, I mean, of course she made a lot of money and she was, you know, uh, making a, it, having to do some of this stuff. But I, deep down side, tennis was always first. And, and tennis is what got her to, to get those things. And so she was great at always having the mentality of we never missed a practice. We never cut things short because of some sponsor thing. And she was very good about that, you know, and, and Max always had our back with that. Yeah. I, I find that uh, one of the biggest things is managing. Yeah. Managing I mean, you're always going to have a few yeah. incidents, yeah, little something here, there, whatever. But for them, when I look at the whole picture, I mean, I have to say almost all the players I've worked with have been pretty good with that. I mean, sometimes, and I think, you know, if you have a good manager or the coach, I mean, actually the, one of the biggest issues I ran in when I was coaching Jesse was the first year, she was actually playing doubles with Taylor Townsend when they were both really young. They got a wild card at the open. Taylor was 16, Jesse was 17, and they both won around in qualies. And then they signed up for a wild card. They actually got, yeah, they got a wild card in the open. They made third round of the doubles. But it, I remember the WTA was having both of them do like 8,000 things a day, you know, because they were both like rookie pros or something. And I remember Taylor walking around like exhausted and Jesse, and I was fighting with everybody <laughs> trying to get them to get, you know, get out of there, whatever. And, you know, Billie Jean King Day and, you know, and all this stuff is good and important, but at the end of the day, you got, you still got to play the next day, you know, yeah. these are young kids. So I think as coaches, that's like you said, managing is, is much harder in some ways than the coaching, the tennis coaching, the X's and O's of coaching, especially during a tournament, you know, little things here, a little there, obviously we give them strategy, different stuff, but the work has to be done by the time the tournament comes. And now you're just trying to manage and, 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 and help take pressure things those things become much more important at that point than coaching the x's and o's of tennis and a lot of people can't do that now let me ask you because as a coach um win or lose whenever you coach a player that plays against serena it's it's also memorable for you right so i can right. remember the covid us open third round i think sloan was up six two Oh, Two, I remember like, that. 40 yeah. love, 2 0, 40, 50, something where it was like, all right, we out of here, right? Right. And then you slowly start to see the match sort of slip away, right? Right. Like, right. God damn. You know what I mean? Even yeah. though that was post pregnancy, Serena, there's right. still a W against Serena for the player and for the coach. Right. Uh, tell me about, well, did you ever have, first of all, I'm sure you had a couple chances in seven years to coach some of those Maria. Serena battles. Tell me yeah. about one of the most memorable ones. Well, there's one that still like bothers me. It's crazy because, um, and, it, and they showed it not that long ago on Tennis Channel. So it, the the year, so when Maria beat Serena in the finals of Wimbledon, uh, Serena was a nervous wreck. I mean, some you know Maria played well, but Serena didn't start playing. That it didn't play well. I think she probably felt a lot of pressure playing Maria. She was young, whatever. But Serena played a bad match, and Maria won it. And then they played in the championships in the finals that same year, and Serena was actually up 4-0 in the third, but had a pulled stomach muscle, and then Maria came back and won 6-4 in the third. And uh, but it was a weird match because they were in the finals and then like Serena on the second set, like started serving like half speed. So you could tell something was wrong with her. But then it's so, like Maria won the second set. And then a the third, she just Serena went four games and hit like winners all over the place, but was still serving like half speed. And then and then Maria won the last six games. 
So it was a weird match. But the one match that kills me is a, a few months after that, they played an Australian Open and Maria had three or four match points. And Serena won, I think it was like 10, eight in the third. And it was an unbelievable match. Like they both played well. And I really thought Maria should have won the match. I think on match points, Serena hit like a shank that went 20 feet up in the air and landed on the baseline, whatever. Uh, but it was, a, it was a great match that Serena won. And then the final Serena beat Lindsay. But I feel like Maria would have won that match. She would have won. I, I, I think she would have won another Grand Slam. And then they didn't play believe it or not, for a really long time, because I think right after that, Serena had some of her health issues and stuff. And then about two or three years later, they played in Charleston. And I remember Maria was number one and Serena was coming back and they played in the quarterfinals and Serena beat Maria in a tight three set match, like a really good match. And then because uh, it was like Maria's 21st birthday or something, because we went to New York, I think, uh, for her birthday right after. And then, then they didn't play again for like a while. Uh, oh, they, and then there was another match where they played in the finals of Australian Open. And this was amazing because Serena looked terrible the whole tournament and Maria was playing lights out. It was maybe a year later. And Maria beat Kleisters in the semis, like two and two. And Serena had quarters. She was down match point against Pierre. I think Shahar Pierre, like she barely yeah. got through Pierre. And then in the semi, she was playing Vitasova. And I remember Max asking me, who would you rather Maria play, Serena or Vitasova? Because Vitasova was just coming up. And I remember saying Serena, because I said, Serena is not playing well. She was a little overweight. She couldn't move. And, I, and Serena ended up winning just because of her experience. And then they played in the finals and come out. I've never seen... A, a woman player play. Serena just played unreal just blew her <laughs> off the court and I did not see that one coming like honestly like she just served unreal you know she beat I think they closed the roof and she beat Maria like two and one and it was just mm. a beat down and and there was nothing Maria could really do and I think that match and then they didn't play again for like a year or two and then by that time I I think I was done with Maria and then that's when they played like a ton of times mm. when they were both like one and two and she was working i think with with thomas hogstead whatever but but that match that she that serena played um in the finals was like you know not only was it amazing uh sorry I think, what not only was it amazing match, but the the level she brought and i think that that match also affected Maria the next 10, 12 times she played her, to be honest. Mm. And, and I think it, I think it became somewhat mental, but I also think it was a huge, it was a matchup problem. And I think ultimately Maria probably had the most respect for Serena over any player because I, you know, and I'm just saying this based on what I think she never said, but I just feel like Maria always felt no matter who she was playing, I think she always felt like she, she, she had a shot, you know, even if she's playing Sloan or some Sloan might be playing, you know, beating her or whatever. But I feel like Maria always felt like if she hung in there, if she was tough, like she could turn it around. But I think there was a point with Serena where it was just like Serena's bringing her a game. Maria, I think start was pretty predictable in some ways, how she was playing. And Serena yeah. went through that period for, you know, three, four years where she just blew her away. But it, it, it I, when I was with her, they they played a handful of times, but you know th those were kind of the matches that I remember. Yeah. Now you talk about Serena Williams, and always like now we think about like Serena post sort of the uh, the embolism post pregnancy. You had the opportunity to to, to coach Vika. Yes. Right. And I'm gonna say I practice in Carson a lot, and you know Vika would always practice on that far back court closest to the track. And yeah, you just hear, eh, eh, you know, right. you hear the screech, right? And I always was like, man, this girl gets after it mm -hmm. in practice, right? Yeah. And you know, it sounds the ball is sounds better than it is. Yeah, once you're behind, <laughs> yeah. It, right? You know what I mean? Like the ball is actually yeah. really light, and it really ain't going anywhere. You right. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But but the, but the the level, like her body language and intensity, yeah, really. I'm like, damn, that that's a pro practice, right? Where well, some other players practice yeah. differently, a little more casual, a little more relaxed, a little more loose. So I always, you know, was was impressed by. Yeah, Vika's she practice. bring it. Yeah. 
Right. Uh, but it's interesting as coaches how we get these girls uh, and we're coaching them, you know, obviously to managing their tennis career, but you get them at very interesting parts of their life. Right. right? Where they're dating, they start yeah. to get engaged, they start yeah. to fall in love. It's, you know, they're starting yeah. to like, you know, just all these other things with all the insecurity, all the balancing, maybe trying to do school online, all these interesting things. Right. So tell me what that was like coaching yeah. Lita post pregnancy. Yes. I mean, it was, it's part of the reason I even started working with her because I had so much respect for her always. I mean, before she had the baby and the years I was with Maria, I mean, she's, I think two years younger than Maria. So I remember Maria playing her when Vika was 17 and Maria was 19 and they had battles. And, and to me, Vika was like the closest in a way to Maria. I mean, obviously they didn't play exactly alike, but the, 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 the grunting, the intensity, you know, the fighting, the, competitive spirit all that stuff reminded me so much of maria and as a coach you know that's especially when you get a player at 16 17 with a lot of that's already there you know we can sometimes help bring it out or help them in certain ways but that competitiveness and that intensity is i think is is there already and so with vika i always had this huge respect for that and so when i, I at the time i was working with jesse when vika came back uh, she had the baby and then they they reached out to me and and I didn't know her personally very well, but I I always had a ton of respect. And then Jesse, who I'd been with for a long time, had hip surgery. And she wasn't gonna play for almost a year. And so it was I really felt like, you know, Vika could get back, you know, to number one or whatever. And so I did a lot of research too. I, I looked up like when women have babies, like you know, can they come back and do different sports? And then I found out that a lot of them actually are stronger after and um you know a lot of different things that i found out and so i spent the first two three months with vika just kind of getting her back in shape getting her back her body in shape uh, getting back to the competitiveness and i remember it was pretty funny i went to belarus and i was training there for like three weeks and we were just so she was literally just coming back so we were hitting and i was hitting with we were doing drills and stuff and then after like two, three weeks, I, I got a couple boys that were there. To, and then one day I was like, well, why don't you guys just play some points? And there was two boys playing against Vika. They're two points each. And, and Vika was like fist pumping. It was the funniest thing. Like literally like two, three points into it, Vika's like fist pumping and, and stuff. And I'm sitting here and I remember telling her, you know, her some people around her at the time. I'm like, we, there's no way we can keep this going for another two or three months. Like she has to play something. Like, and yeah. then I was kind of shooting for her to have a really good summer. Like the hard court summer is usually where she does best and probably her best surface. And so we actually had her play Wimbledon, um, almost as like a, you know, to get some matches in Wimbledon. Actually, we played the first tournament back was Mallorca, so she played Mallorca and then Wimbledon, and we were using that grass to kind of get some matches and stuff so that when we started in Stanford and leading up to us open, I felt like having those matches would help her. And she actually had a great Wimbledon. I mean, she made fourth round and she, she had set points against Halep in the first set and then she lost a tight match, but I thought she did, did great and was in a really good place. And then we went back to California. We, I think we went to Carson for a week practice. So I was all pumped to go to Stanford and have a great summer. And then that's when the issues with the, with Billy and the baby and, and then the custody issues. And then unfortunately the next five months, she didn't play, you know, we trained, we practiced, we kept waiting to go somewhere. Um, but then it was really tough for her. She was spending, you know, days in court and all that she couldn't leave LA and it was tough because she would still bring that intensity, but you know, she's in court two, three days. And then she's comes out on the practice court two, three days. So the next five, six months were tough with the whole custody battle. And then ultimately that's why I moved on. But that's one thing I feel bad about. Like, I think it was circumstances that neither one of us could control, but I actually really enjoyed working with Vika. And even though she, you know, she has her moments of, <laughs> oh, we all know Vika, she has her moments, but she really is a professional, you know, she's going to bring it, you know, a lot of times with the, with the custody and the baby, there was times she had to cancel this and that, but when she stepped on the court, she brought it. And it gets similar to Maria, super competitive, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that, that is something like you could play Vika, any game, mini tennis, ping pong. I think one day I played her ping pong, like 10 games and I almost had a heart attack at somebody's house. She didn't want to stop <laughs> because we were, I was sweating. Yeah. We played ping pong for like three hours. So she, best woman ping pong player I'd seen in a long time. 
but but the point is is like they love to compete and and you know and i think that's i mean that 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 goes so far you know that that and i think in some ways it's not even that they just love to compete it's the fact that somebody's trying to beat them they don't want somebody to take like what they have <laughs> you know, it's kind of like you know they're gonna go do whatever to to not you know give away something they have so that having a competitor like that on your side it's, it's tough to beat yeah you know what's funny is you know, when you coach people through that phase and they kind of start out their career, maybe they got a little bit of money, but then it, it progressed and progressed and they got to a point where they're really comfortable, right? right? And like money no longer an issue, money no longer is enough to motivate them. Right. right? And then you see the champions who start to just play for personal pride. Yeah, exactly. Right? And, and I think that, you know, when you look at sort of mature players who have made enough to quit today, Right. Like a, Vito, still- like a Maria, like a Serena, right. you know, like a Venus, like a Sloan, you know, the only thing, you know, like you try to like different motivators. Hey, you know what? I'll right. buy you a bird. I'll split a Birkin bag with you if you win. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Well, I already have five. You know what I mean? So it's like <laughs> right, right. those things aren't enough. You know what I mean? Right. It's just when you get to that point, personal pride is the only thing. And I think when I listen to you talk about Vika, this, when it came to my mind is one of the things that she has that makes her great, no matter what type of shape she's in, no matter right. how she's hitting the ball, is when you are coaching a player that's going to play her, she could just suck, right? That yeah. just have like a bad three or four months, a bad stretch. She always has personal pride. And so you always got to be ready to play. Exactly. Uh, and I think yeah, that's yeah. like the, a championship characteristic. A championship it is. Characteristic. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, that's what's so amazing about the men these days. Like, I mean, Djokovic and the dog, I mean, the amount of money and the fame and what they, they love the process. I mean, they love the process of, of keep improving. They love competing they love being out there. I mean, that's something that you can't really give somebody, you know, and you yeah. see it in kids. I mean, you see the kids that want to, you know, you see the kids that do it because their parents want them to do it or they think they have to do it. And then you see the kids that just love it and just want to be out there and just want to, you know, they're they're breaking down. The, I'm working with my godson now. He's or he's 14. He's a he's a yeah, boy here down here in uh, Delray Beach. But the kid loves it. Yeah, I mean, the kid loves it. And, and, and you know, he's a good player. He's going to get. But the, the fact that the you know, it's raining and then the courts are wet and then you're like, okay, well, maybe we'll bag this afternoon. But then he's like, you know, sitting by the window waiting to get out there. <laughs> you know, then you like as a coach too, that helps you want to push and want to spend yeah. the time, you know? And, and that's where I always felt that with Maria, Vika, you know, to have players, Jesse was like that, you know, Jesse could have easily she had so much money and, and different, but she loved tennis, you know, and she loved to, yeah, it, yeah, it's a long, you know how it is. It's a long year. It's a long career. It's a long, so you're always going to have little days here and there. But for the most part, those players are asking you. They they want your, they want you to spend time with them. They want to learn. They want to get out there. You know, as a coach, that's that's the greatest gift the player can give you. And I think they also have their list, right? From the players yes. I've coached, they all have their list where it's like, eh, oh, I don't yeah. mind losing, but I'm not going to lose to you. I'm not going to yeah, lose. Yeah, it's right? just, you know, like, I that's don't right. lose to anybody but your ass. You know what yeah, I mean? Right. I think every player, especially the women, like, they have their list of people. And no matter how how they're hitting yeah. the ball, how they're feeling, nah, I'm not going to lose that. that. That was Daniel Hantakova for Maria. Oh, my God. I told the story so many times where every time Daniel Hantakova would play Maria, she'd come out playing really well. <laughs> and I swear to God, I saw Maria beat her maybe nine times. And, you know, semis of Indian Wells, quarters of a Grand Slam, whatever. And every single time they played, Hantukova would come. Sometimes she'd win the first set. Sometimes she'd be up a break. But she'd always come out playing really good. And then Maria would win some point or something where she would just, like, get fired up, fist pump, whatever. And then you'd see Hantukova go straight down the tube. And Maria would just – and win every time. It, but every time – and then Maria would say after, like, there's no way I'm losing to her. Like, no way. And it's kind of funny because – a lot of times that's what it comes down to. You can throw everything else out, you know? Well, let me ask you this, Dan. My last question, you've been so generous with your time, but one question I want to ask you is goes to your career. Um, Because as coaches, I think that we recognize a window, right? We recognize where you're healthy, 
Yeah. Off court stuff's in a good place. You're hitting the ball well. The draw is good. You had a good ranking where you got a good seed, so the middle of the draw kind of thing. And we've got about eight or nine months where we can make a run. Right. right? As a coach, when you, you see those things come together and you know it. But when you were playing and you look at that 95, 96 kind of time frame where you made fourth round of Wimbledon, uh, third round of Indian Wells, quarters of Miami, what sort of was going on then? That And, and when I say fourth round of Wimbledon, right, most people are like, oh, fourth round of Wimbledon. But let me tell you, fourth round of a slam is hard as hell, right? Right, right. Quarters of a 1,000 is hard as hell. And so when I look at those, I'm not a guy that, like, takes those for granted. You know, even having coached right. Grand Slam champion, the finalist at French Open, won Miami, that's hard to do, right? right? But what went right? Because as a coach, you can kind of see when things are lining up. But as a, what did you think? went right that time yeah well i i think i know what went right and it's probably similar i just thought of this just now while you're mentioning that it's probably similar to sloan when she won the open in some ways I, people like what was crazy was i actually in the fall i mean in the spring so in 95 in the spring i remember i went to asia and i was ranked about 120 or something and then i was pushing to get i was getting close to like top 100 and um, I remember I went to Asia and I got, I played Japan Open. So I ended up getting mono, mononucleosis. And I was trying to get enough points to get into Wimbledon. That was like my goal, you know, get, get to top 105 or whatever it was. And I remember I flew from Seoul, Korea to Malta to play like this 75 challenger. And I was so sick when I got there. I didn't know I had mono. I just, I thought I had like a bad flu. And I remember getting there and I was so sick. I was coughing I had this rash on me. I was with my coach and I remember being so sick. And I, I figured out if I win one match, like I, I have a good shot at getting in Wimbledon. And I, somehow I won the first round and then I had to like pull out of the tournament. I went home and I got to like 106 or something. And I remember I flew home and I went to the doctor and, and then I had mono and I basically was in bed for like a month and really sick and and so forth but i did get in wimbledon and so my goal was to try to there was maybe a couple months before the grass and i had done well a couple years before in the juniors so i like grass court tennis and stuff but it was interesting because during that period of time of being in bed for like a month and not playing for a couple months it really made me appreciate like the game again in a way because you know it's easy to get caught up in this like you know, you're, you're chasing points, you're traveling, you're there, everybody's, you know, it's, it's probably even worse now with social media, but everybody thinks you're doing well based on your number, ranking, you know, whatever. And, and I just miss like the game, like playing tennis and being able to go. And when you first, when I first came back from the mono, I mean, I could only hit for 10, 15 minutes, uh, you know, without getting tired. And then I remember going over the grass, the doctor gave me the okay to go. And I remember playing the, the week before, Wimbledon I played Nottingham qualifying and I lost this guy Colin Beecher you probably know him because he's a good coach now out of Britain but we always joke because he he was he was like 300 or something and I lost to him and I remember calling him my parents because they were going to come watch because they had never been to Wimbledon now main draw and I remember calling my parents I'm like don't come like <laughs> I'm playing so bad and then I had to play Mark Rosé, who had just won the Olympics. He was seated like number nine. And I saw the draw, you know, Wimbledon, they put the draw like a week before. And I remember calling my parents, don't come. This is it. And they came anyway. And I remember like I got won that match. But after doing well at Wimbledon, then I had a really good summer, too. I did well in D.C. and then I beat Courier L.A. But but I really over the years, I thought a lot about it. I mean, I started thinking, is it because I lost weight? I lost like 20 pounds. <laughs> I was thinking of all things, but I think really the main thing was I appreciated the game. You know, I appreciate, and I remember reading some about Sloan or maybe you mentioned some stuff when she won the Open. I think she had like, wasn't she out a lot that year or something? Yeah. yeah. And, 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 but I really think that's what it was, you know, all of a sudden things we take for granted, especially it's easy. Um, you know, you go on the, people don't realize when you're, a pro and you're on the road you, the tennis they see the tennis on tv or they see the results but there's so much more goes into it you know can, flying staying in other hotels being away from your family there's so much that goes into it. a lot of players don't like that part and you don't know how somebody's going to like that or react to that and for me i was comfortable in a way i loved where i lived i was i got along with my family well i liked being in la i liked i mean there's certain things i would have done probably a little bit different looking back on it but i think that period of time really made me appreciate 
the fact that this is my life. This is what I chose to do. I get a chance to play a sport for a living and see the world. And I think it changed my whole mentality. And I feel like I rode that for the next couple of years. And then obviously when you start thinking that way, you feel a little better, you start having better, it ups the confidence because your results start to get better. And, but I really think that was the fact that I didn't think I was going to be able to play Wimbledon or whatever. And, and, and that I think helped me get better quicker. And then the fact that I had such a good result and, and then it pushed into the summer, I think it, it, it kind of spring, spring rolled me to like better things. And, and sometimes that's life, you know, you, you have something tough and, and it turns out to actually be a blessing. Mm. Well, man, I, I really appreciate your time. It's been great. Uh, Thank you, buddy. Great stories. Uh, thank you for sharing. You know, a lot of people don't share a lot, but thank you for sharing. Uh, a yes. lot of respect for me. I understand how hard it is. When I look at your player roster. A, it's hard to get the job. <laughs> B, it's hard to help players. And it's actually a lot of work and a lot of pressure yeah. to take on right. the level of talent that you took on yeah. um, and to actually do well in, in all situations. So, Right. You know, I want to thank you for coming on the show, man. And uh, thanks, Kamal. I really, I, I'm looking forward to coming up to Chicago one of these days. Oh yeah, come on up, I brother. Know. Come on and up. Then, yeah, I yeah, last year I sent. Uh, well, there was a Polish girl. Yes, uh, Swiatek's old coach. Um, yes. He, yeah, he, he there. He had a couple of Polish girls that were going. I think play those tournaments and yep. and I yeah and they went there early. I, I need to get up there. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Well, this has been a Tennis.com podcast with Michael Joyce, uh, former coach Maria Sharapova, Jesse Pagula, Jeannie Bouchard, Joe Conta, Vika Azarenka, and a great player in his own right. So don't forget that. Don't let his coach <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, like another life. <laughs> right, right. Well, thanks, Camille. I really appreciate it. Thanks thank for having me. Thank you for me. joining.